Thank you, Manuel. Thank you to both of the organizers uh, for uh, doing this really great and relevant session. Um, and it's really great to be in Edinburgh. You're going to be hearing for the next 15 minutes about Ipswich. Has anyone here been to Ipswich? Yes. Oh, it's pretty good. All right, let me hear about that. All right, good. Um, so some of you will be familiar with this really wonderful um, early medieval town. So uh, although I'm probably quite critical of, in almost every way, of uh, Viggo and Child's theory, um, his very kind of fundamental question kind of still generally frames uh, my research interest, um, which is the origins of towns and cities. So it, these images are both Mipswich, and I am interested in how a place goes from like the image you see on the left, which is the River Orwell, uh, to the image you see on the right. Yeah? Um, and I'm quite interested in the, the real kind of meat and dynamics of this transformation. Um, in the case of Ipswich, this happens, I mean, it doesn't look like it does in that picture, but it happens in, in a few hundred years. Uh, I will say, of course, that Ipswich is not, by any stretch, the first town in Britain, um, but it is perhaps one of the oldest continuously inhabited towns in Britain, and when it appeared, there were no other towns in that region, in East, in East Anglia. Uh, urban emergence for early medievalists has been a really vexing question for quite a long time. I see there are two hurdles uh, which I'm going to try to address here. Uh, the first is this top-down versus bottom-up dichotomy, uh, which I've heard discussed a bit today. Uh, and the second is this really vexing question of who founded town. So who founded Ipswich and who founded other towns like Ipswich has been a really difficult question um, for, for us early medieval urbanists. So for the next 13-ish minutes, um, we have three parts of this presentation. We're going to try to briefly introduce some new evidence from Ipswich, uh, then look at uh, a theoretical framework that might help us overcome those two hurdles. Uh, and then I'm going to try to show you those or that theoretical framework in action. So, uh, as I said before, Ipswich is arguably Britain's oldest town uh, that's been continuously inhabited. There's definitely very a lot of room to uh, disagree with that. Um, the thing with Ipswich is that it has had urban characteristics from 7th or 8th century continuing up to the present. So it's not like it was a village in the 8th century and then at some point became a town later on, or that it was a town in the 8th century and then declined, became a village or disappeared, then reappeared. It has basically been a town since the year 7th. 20, the year 730, up until whatever today is, December something, 10th of 2022. Um, and what's quite neat about Ipswich is that there's no preceding Roman colony or town here. Um, so it's sometimes uh, archaeologists in the Middle Ages in, in Britain and other parts of Europe are quite lucky because we're seeing how towns are adapting and being built on top of an existing urban framework. But here actually what we're seeing is the making of an urban framework, is urban fabric making. Uh, so just so the rest of you are aware, um, Ipswick was called uh, Gipswick or probably Ipswick in, in, in Old English. Um, it's part uh, or it's a type of settlement that some medieval archaeologists call an emporium. Uh, this is a map of some emporia. Uh, there are these sort of town-like uh, settlements that existed around the North and Baltic Seas in the English Channel, uh, 600 to 800, 850-ish. Um, and that kind of low resolution GIF you see on the right uh, is kind of output of my research in, in a way. Um, I've been looking at Ipswich for the last three and a half years, uh, trying to build a really detailed chronology, uh, mostly based off of uh, pottery fabrics, but also on radiocarbon dates and tree ring dates uh, and stratigraphy. And so what was quite neat is I was able to see how the town changed and grew from effectively a kind of a place on, or a space on the estuary to a, a place where it's apparently uh, continuously and permanently inhabited. Um, and the location of, of the streets in, in Ipswich uh, in, in the 8th century continue more or less to, or least, well, the ones that have been excavated continue more or less to where they are today. So uh, I've been looking at a lot of different elements of Ipswich today. I'm just going to focus on roads. Uh, again, for a lot of medieval towns, the roads are just continuing um, from the Roman period, or at least continuing their alignment with earlier roads in the Roman period. That isn't the case with Ipswich. Uh, with Ipswich, the new roads are, are appearing. Um, I'm going to be looking at where these red dots are. That's where the, the excavated parts of roads have been. So the I'm going to have sort of one and a half case studies here. This upper settlement here, this uh, pink polygon, is a whole excavation area. Uh, that's the Buttermarket Cemetery, which was um, it was one of the very few published excavations at Ipswich. It was published in the late 2000s by Chris Skull, um, and there it was a uh, seventh century 
cemetery there, over 100 um, inhumations were recovered. What's quite interesting about it is that within a period, uh, after a period of disuse, uh, town kind of grew over the cemetery. Um, so you can see there's three structures and St. Stephen's Lane that still exists um, and a few pits. Uh, we don't know how long exactly the cemetery went out of use, between three and 100 years. Uh, the lower estimate is probably more likely, actually. So it's not that the cemetery was probably forgotten about, um, and indeed the St. Stephen's Lane there uh, cut through uh, a mound surrounding a kind of small burial ground. So it seems that there was awareness they were building over a cemetery. And in a traditional framework, this might be seen as, uh, or it might be thought of as being kind of top-down versus bottom-up. So either that there is a, a top-down plan for a cemetery, um, and then there are people who resist that power because they have the imagination to do so um, and, and build their own houses on top of the cemetery. Or, or vice versa, um, that the, uh, the cemetery was a kind of a creative novel um, burial ground. And then uh, some elites, whoever they are, kings or priests or, or reeves or someone, um, had their own plan and so imposed their own vision on top of the cemetery. And now you can see why this is quite vexing for medieval archaeologists, because actually picking out who these agents are is, has been a bit of a mess. So who founded this road might be a kind of microcosm of the question of who founded the town. That's kind of how I'll treat it here for the rest of this presentation. So I'm not going to waste too much of my time with this audience explaining what I mean by new materialism, but I just to make sure we're on the same page, this is the framework I'm trying to use to, to kind of get around these hurdles. Um, so uh, I'm drawing on, on two main authors, really, uh, Delanda um, and, and Bennett, for the vibrant matter. And here's an idea that uh, all things, human or non-human, have a, a capacity to act as sort of quasi-agents. Um, what, what I really like about their frameworks um, is that they kind of block reductionism. So I'm not having to say that we have, you know, Christianization or urbanization as a big process. It's, it's really helped me get into the, the kind of daily life and the real kind of nitpick dynamics of what are the, what are the materials, what are the people that are going on that tr make that transformation that we saw on that second slide from this estuary into this town. Uh, but I, I enumerate this into four advantages, um, which you can see on the screen. First is that it adds those non-human agents. Second, and that it encourages us to treat causality non-linearly which we've heard about um, a little bit in previous papers, and uh, we'll explore that in a moment. Um, and also to deconstruct the analytical uh, black box that is the label TAN, um, which is obviously another really vexing problem, um, and one that will probably never go away for those of us who, who study urbanism. Um, but my idea here is to kind of open it up, dissect it, and really see what are the ingredients and components. In this case, in this case only necessarily, it's not a universal definition of TAN, but what makes Ipswich become towny? People today have no problem identifying Ipswich as a town, it's quite obvious. Um, and so we're trying to find an archaeological understanding of what the origin of that is. Yeah. But we know it's a town today, what is the origin of that? And what are the components that make that up? Um, and then finally, and maybe most importantly for me, is that instead of talking about who founded the town, I want to talk about how the tr uh, town emerged. And instead of talking about a genesis of a new type of place, I actually talk about a transformation of an existing space, an existing component, and how they're just reassembling into something new. So I, I quite like this kind of diagram. The idea here is that a town is made up of different parts, food webs, uh, certain human behaviors, economic production, relationships between people, social interactions, etc. Um, it's not necessarily an exhaustive list, but those are examples of, of different components that might make up a town if we treat the town as a complex system. Um, and so all of those things, if they interact in a more or less permanent way, in just the right way, um, can be like a town. In the same way that you might have um, I don't know, molecules or, or, or you know, elements, el elemental atoms um, interacting with just the right type of bonds, with just the right type of different other elements um, to create a new type of chemical substance or, you know, organs in a, an organ system or organs in a, an organism. Um, and these can feed into each other and a town sort of emerges as a transformation of things that already exist rather than a genesis of something entirely new. So... Going back to St. Stephen's Lane, I want to go through this a bit quickly. There's a second lane that appeared a bit later, in, at, towards the end of my study period, uh, between 860 and 900, that appears parallel, more or less parallel, to St. Stephen's Lane, uh, which I've called Market Lane. That street actually doesn't exist anymore. Um, but if we go back and, and trace this history, what's quite interesting is that this road is metalled, so you know what metal is, it's kind of a gravel surface, um, over a hollow track, 
And it's not known whether the hollow track was hollowed out by water or hollowed out by traffic. Uh, the excavator, Keith Wade, preferred the former. Um, but either way, the point is that, that track turned into a road. And there's a pretty good chance that people were using that track sort of as a, a shortcut. So someone might say that the, the, the hollow was something of a, a virtual road. Uh, and it actualized from existing components, the natural hollow that already existed, um, in, to people using it as a road. Why that happens is up to speculation. Um, there might be interesting discourses of power to, to tease out of that. Uh, I like the fact that maybe people were using simply as a shortcut. Maybe they're trying to circumvent tolls for bringing your wane over the graveled road. Um, either way, both roads were eventually metalled or remetalled in, in this kind of 40 year period. Uh, and then, of course, maintenance is also part of the urban fabric, and the two roads aren't maintained equally. In fact, you can see, I mean, it's hard because not all of St. Stephen's Lane is well excavated, but there are pits that cut into uh, Market Lane that don't cut into St. Stephen's Lane. And there's a layer of refuse on St. Stephen's Lane that we don't have um, on the other. Um, I don't know if that is the result of kind of etiquette and kind of on the ground situations of people kind of negotiating space or if it's part of a town plan. Um, but the important thing for me here is the road kind of emerging from these different um, components. I want to go through this. My more favorite example is Franciscan Way. Um, so Franciscan Way is kind of blacksmithing taskscape. Uh, perhaps I have three structures here, uh, two forges and a series of pits um, from within that time period based on the pottery they're recovered from. It's about 141 kilograms of uh, iron slag in there. So it's quite a large um, blacksmithing taskscape. There's also a ditch that runs alongside the road, but the, the road is not contemporaneous with the ditch. It covers, covers that ditch. Um, and again, as with the previous example, I like to kind of go backwards and see what the origin of this road is. Um, have four phases here. have a well, which is tree ring dated to 585, 688. Um, and then we have a series of ditches, uh, one of which uh, conveniently uh, cuts through the well. Uh, my interpretation, and again, the interpretation of the excavator, these are flood control channels. The idea being that you can't stop flooding, but you can direct the way that flood waters are, are moving through the landscape near the town. I should say the Old River Gipping, again, no longer there, uh, runs basically parallel to this ditch, uh, to, to the kind of west of, of the map. Um, and then there was a series of channels replacing them, again, perhaps reinforcing the interpretation that they're flood control channels being washed out. Uh, and this final phase, which is sort of the 50 years before the blacksmithing taskscape, there's no road, but there are pits with the smallish number, uh, less than 10 kilograms overall, of slag recovered from them. So one possible interpretation here um, is that there's a kind of early blacksmithing taskscape before the other one appeared in detail. And so I'd like to come up with this kind of story here, a series of actants, um, some human, some non-human, um, not all of them having the intention of there being a road, but the road is the ultimate result. So first, the, road, the river itself may be an actant, uh, acting on the road by flooding its banks, causing humans, or the second actant, to dig flood control channels. Um, then those channels become an actant themselves, perhaps by directing terrestrial traffic, uh, because if the channel uh, you know, ran all the way into the estuary at the waterfront, anyone who wanted to walk from the waterfront upriver would have encountered the channel instead of the river. And so if they wanted to follow the river, of course, they would have walked along this kind of eastern side of the, of the channel. Um, and then in, in doing so, they may have tread grass, and it's slightly speculative, um, and therefore tread grass encourages yet more travelers. And you know how this works, there's a feedback loop here. You have a trackway that appears, which makes people say, oh look, there's a trackway. And then once there's a trackway, more people follow that route, which makes the trackway even more obvious. Yeah, and so we have a feedback loop, quite literally. Um, thus resulting in a potential trickle of clients as more people travel that way encouraging blacksmiths to go there. And then eventually we have a kind of system where there's an informal road and then a blacksmithing taskscape that emerges from that. And again, here the point is um, that the road emerges from all of these um, people, or uh, actants, some human, some non-human, not necessarily acting as top down or bottom up, but uh, chaotically and non-linearly. I, I might leave you with this point, which is from uh, actually one of my undergrad students, um, which is that, uh, History of a town is not explicable as a, as a, as a dialogue between top-down or bottom-up. Um, it's not a, like the game Pong, but rather more like the tabletop game Hunger Hunger Hippos, where we have uh, different actants with different capacities acting you know, non-linearly uh, and chaotically from multiple directions. Thank you.